So on the bench today is finally a project just for me. After many, many years of spending time on the road and repairing amps and guitars and systems for various artists, I have very, very rarely ever done anything for myself. So this will be the first time that I gift myself a little bit as I'm turning in slowly toward retirement from the music industry and on to other things that I wanted to give myself a something nice to play through uh, in the rare event that I played. So I wanted something that was going to be super clean and that's how I choose to run most of my rigs. I like putting pedals through the preamp of an amplifier and using a tube amp to drive the speaker. Not that big into um, effect loops. I think that they're useful and certainly have their place. In, and I may even add one here uh, in the future. But for right now, what I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of return myself back to being a player again and having a little bit of that excitement in something for me and something that I could personally enjoy. So in order to do that, I sort of wanted to take myself out of the equation as far as what would I do to this amp? Because the problem with that is, for me, is if I start going down the road of what did I do for this artist that they requested and put that in there, and what did I do for this artist and I put that in there, different people have different thoughts behind how one of these should be restored. Should it stay a bass amp? Should it go on to a guitar amp? Um, can it be used as a guitar amp in a bass amp state? All those sorts of questions. What are the best components to replace? Are there certain circuit upgrades you can do? Modifications? Can you make another circuit out of it if it wasn't the originally designed circuit that you have before you? All of those things are a plethora of thoughts and ideas that in one essence can be seen as, oh, that can be a lot of fun. You can kind of do whatever you want. But in another essence, maybe I just want to be the discerning player. Maybe I just want to try to use my ears and get somebody else's take. Well, then that takes me hiring one of me to go do this. Well, that kind of is, is redundant in nature. But there's a middle ground. That middle ground for me was finding somebody that already had a high level of understanding of these circuits beyond myself, of course, and has opinions as to how these circuits should sound. And that makes the work for me kind of return back to just being a tech and not, not having to think, doing what somebody else says, although I am the end receiver. So in one essence, it's a psychological battle for myself to have fun with. So with that being said, my intention is to take this very clean Fender Basement amp and turn it into a guitar amplifier for myself. So let's take a look at this puppy and I'll show you how I plan to go about this. First off, as you can see, it's quite a clean specimen. Not much has been done to this, if anything, since its inception into the world. So this particular amplifier, again, as you can see, is, is quite clean overall very untouched by anybody else all the original tubes and we can look at the bottom here as well and just see that it still has the brackets that are were intended to mount to the bottom cabinet so the head wouldn't vibrate off during a performance so what we're going to do with this is i'm going to go extensively step by step and discuss how i came up with what i wanted to do with it and how i worked with another company to help me make those decisions. So let's get right into that before we go any further. And before we actually start getting into the amplifier, let's talk about the road. So here is the road, as I was saying. I chose to start communication with a very nice gentleman from VintageFenderAmpRepair.com. His name is Mike Pascal. And he and I got to talking about what could we do with this particular amplifier in its current circuit state to make it more like I want it to sound. And I wanted to get his opinions. So one of the things that this company does that I think is pretty neat is they offer mod kits. So again, I have my own mods. I have my own understanding as to how to make certain 
colors and flares come out of certain circuits and how to make different gain stages and shape a sound for somebody but in this case I don't really have to think that much which is nice again takes me away from ha having to be the tech and I can just be the player having some fun again so I'm trying to go back to my earlier days and find the enjoyment in doing these sorts of repairs so what we did is we came up and decided that we're going to take the current circuit and we're going to make it a different circuit and he put together a package for me based upon his years of experience in making these individual circuits and now what a neat thing that this company does that a lot of companies don't do let's take a look at this one this is not the kit per se but let's look at one of the offerings is let's see if we can bring this photo up here all right so so what you can see here is just a photo of a preamp section and some some caps and resistors that were chosen for this particular style of circuit modification and they put the kit together and they say for instance this is just one if you have an ab165 basement then our ab165 to aa864 conversion kit is for you and they go through and they have a direct instruction line for the model of amp in this case 50 basement basement 100 let's take a look at what he sent so we'll start here i'll be very careful to open the box okay so so here we can see a list of parts that were identified and he has a disclaimer sheet here and he has made a circuit for me from the amp AB165 layout and he has highlighted all of the individual uh, changes that will need, need to be made here so there is that and additionally let's see what else we get to there is an instruction list so there is Mike's card vintage amp repair Mike Pascal and Jimmy fat amplifiers Mike Pascal also owner builder and founder of that company so here he has identified the tweed preamp caps for me and those look like Jupiter caps and a resistor and a ceramic cap in there that's great uh, remaining signal cap so this must be being remaining in the process right and the AB165 to AA864 conversion that we're going to be doing and all those caps there that will need replacing resistors that will need updating this of course is the very first thing that we'll do all the electrolytics that need to be replaced for this particular model and other caps and resistors in various places a bunch more resistors all high quality look at this beautiful i don't got to think i don't have to order i don't have to make a whole bunch of orders <laughs> i don't have to task mauser task digi key i get it from one place somebody's done all the research for me i can just have fun as a tech put all the parts in fire it up that's awesome Look how clean that is. This is the AB165 model for the basement amp and back then 117 volts was standard common voltage coming out of your wall to you at 60 cycles AC. Um, so this, as you can see here this is two 6L6 GCs, there's a 12AT7 and there's 370.25s or 12AX7 uh, in today's uh, speak. And that transformer says 606822. And then this small transformer says 606821. 
that's an indication. Let's check the last one. There it is again. So uh, let's see if you can see that. 606831. So what year is this? This is in 1968. All right, so let's see what is under here. Oh, look at that. Very nice. All original. Still solid. Doesn't look like there's a lot of time. Oh, there are some uh, indications of some leakiness, possibly. So let's zoom in here. Before we can even um, bother to turn this on and see if we have functionality, these have got to go. A 100 UF. These are F and T, I think. 22, 22, so these are modern replacements, right? 22, oh no, 16, and 22. So we've got a direct replacement for this 16. The 22s will replace the 20s, and the 100s will, will, will replace the 70s. I may or may not replace these resistors depending on how far they've drifted in value. This unit doesn't look like it has a lot of time on it. Uh, and these are Allen Bradley style resistors and typically they don't, they don't go that bad, but they can depending. So the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to go about and simply clip off all of these uh, caps. In fact, I guess we'll do that in no time like the present, right? So I'm going to leave myself the lead and leave the short side right in the middle so I can I'm not going to tie to those leads but I'm going to just get the caps off so I can take those leads out and replace the with the new ones Just leaving myself something to grab there. And that is definitely drifted above value. 236. We can look at the bottom of this board to see, and try to show you what's underneath there. You can see the connections. So this is just a fold, folded over piece of turret board. And underneath, to keep the connection not touching the other side, this is a barrier so it doesn't touch the ground side. So you'll see that when I cut those leads, these leads can end up staying in there. I'm not a fan of that. So when I take them out, they will come out independently or some will actually be bends that are in through there. So show you what I mean so the very first page is a disclaimer to work safely so educate yourself make sure that you know what you're doing when working on tube amplifiers that's their disclaimer and they go on to talk about large filter caps that the voltage for sure um, make sure you know what you're doing there observing the correct polarity extremely important so make sure that's happening Let's check it at 120 hertz, the new electrolytics. Should be 100 UF. There it is, spot on. Let's look at the ESR now. 0.2 ohms. Yeah, that's pretty good from a brand new electrolytic. In case you didn't take note of which polarity <clears throat> and the position in which these electrolytic caps go they did a nice little diagram here in the instructions where they actually laid out which ones go where and where what their polarity is one thing to take note of is that there's a tie situation happening on the negative side here and then the negative to positive side here and that's just done with bare wire here it's done with resistors so if we take a look at the bottom of this board i'll try to lift this up without contorting it too much you can see those connections on the opposite side there I'll try to zoom in just a little bit and basically what they did is they took the 
prior lead of the uh, of, <clears throat> they took the lead of the prior cap and they just strung it through the eyelet and they bent it over. Now you can see all this dirt that's underneath here and some corrosion that happened throughout the years. And some of that's flux from when they originally uh, put these units in here. Some of that can actually become conductive over time. So I'll take the time to clean all of that off as well as any additional flux that happens when I put my new caps in before we, we close this project up. We try to make this as clean as possible through here. Yeah, just one of those little silly pieces of advice that could maybe save your butt someday. You see that little bit, let me get this uh, out of the way. See that little bit of cutoff there when I cut off the bottom of this resistor uh, right here. So, you know, put the resistor through and then I'm a little picky. I, uh, you know, want to make sure that I cut off the end of the resistor so it's not poking into the other piece of turret board there just good practice you could bend it over as well nothing wrong with that that'll work um we all have different ways that we do things as long as you have a mechanical hold in there before you solder that's the most important thing but something that happened to me years ago is a little piece of cutoff i don't remember what project it was i was working on uh of a resistor came off and I didn't notice that it had landed in a tube socket and believe it or not I put a tube in and it bridged two pins that it shouldn't have bridged and we had a little bit of fireworks when I plugged that amp in and had a new repair to do so just be careful that when you're cutting things off and when pieces of wires are coming out and you're you're working on these things that you keep a try to keep a clean slate out about yourself and, and what you're doing be careful of bits and pieces that can fl fly and create shorts where you don't want them. Well, with not a lot of effort, but a whole lot of fun, we put these caps back in there. I'll show you the results. So some techs are gonna say, and they, they're definitely entitled to their opinion. Everyone's gonna have a different way of doing what they do. Some would say, leave these resistors if they are uh, these original resistors if they are not that far out of value absolutely but i figure if i'm in here and these got enough time on them they could be a point of failure in the future heat is not a friend when it comes to this particular section so might as well put brand new modern resistors in there not going to change the sound uh but that's a different argument at any rate all new electrolytics as we can see and another thing that i do that some people don't do and again everyone has their own prerogative is you can see the very bottom of the turret board there is I put the leads through just like the factory did. So some show, some folks choose, and again, their decision, to leave the original leads in and simply snip them and either tie the old capacitor to the uh, lead that was in there or they do them one at a time and leave the original leads from connection point to connection point underneath this section just not the way i like to do it so i literally take solder wick and a, and a a desoldering gun and take all of the solder out of all of the eyelets and then i start new as if i'm the guy from the factory in a sense right I'm obviously not replacing the wires here um but you know just replacing the, the important things and you know then you clean it all up and i've started using a new product um for cleaning flux and uh it's doing all right I'm running out of it quick though this is rma flux remover from microcare so it says extra strength formula removes heavy age flux as well <laughs> not a better project than that for this right so it does a pretty good job it softens them up in some areas where there's really heavy flux which there was quite a bit underneath this section you can still see some remnants here um i have to literally chip, chip it off with a screwdriver but it softens it up enough to be able to do that so um i like that part you know and to the point of you know being doing things on a professional level pulling this old solder out of all of these eyelets and running the lead back behind and bending it through and uh, you know making sure that it's basically how they did it at the factory um, you know if you look at the older technology look at how long these leads were back then you know even from the company Sprague Sprague Adams right so here's an old unused never put into circuit 
But look at how long that lead is. So you think about that when they were designing these amplifiers back then they had a little more to work with you look at a brand new one so look at this brand new f and t compared to you know you got another three quarters of an inch there in lead length and they're both axial capacitors but they added more length back then even here's a, a brand new illinois capacitor compare that here you can see that you know this is the standard has come down for how much lead length they put on there. And that's the same thing for all of these. This is a cool old capacitor, check this out. So this is actually two capacitors in one. This is 10 microfarad, 10 microfarad. And there's your, your common and then the two leads. But again, look at how long in comparison, right? So it's a little bit more work, but when you are able to do so, uh, I think that your the le less is more in electronics when you have leads there. So when I'm manipulating leads, uh, I like this tool here. This is a Milwaukee stripper, but you can see that jaw, right? You can see that jaw there, and it's real flat and gives you enough room to kind of manipulate the lead where you need to. So this is a tool, I, and, and I can get it in there without cutting. That's, that's fairly okay. I, I could work it until it's a little bit more. But then bend the lead in the appropriate place so it has enough room to come back up and then do the same thing on the other side. Looks pretty good. <clears throat> I can cut that off after the fact, leave myself a little handle. So what I'll do here is just drop it down through this one And then I had to actually do that off camera. But basically you manipulate it till she's all the way through there. And again, because this is an amp that's going to be sitting on a speaker that's going to be vibrating, you want to make sure everything has a mechanical lock before and not just rely on the solder. So for instance, I have that item or I have this lead going all the way through there. And what I'm going to do is just give it a, a little bit of a bend. Again, maybe with these pliers a little bit better. A little bit of a bend the opposite direction. And I'll do the same thing with this lead. And that offers, believe it or not, just a little bit of mechanical lock, just bending those leads out a little bit. Again, my way might not be your way at any rate. Uh, so now that we're fully clean through there, what I can do is I just add flux. And I make sure that I get all of the outside of the eyelet. Maybe not the outside, but the rim of the eyelet as well. So I try to touch everything. So I got two leads in this one here. Get that hot enough to where the solder's melting. And once that's done, I'll just grab this lead so that heat doesn't climb up into the capacitor. Using the tweezer as a heat sink. Do the same thing here. You can see I got that little bit of lead there, so I want to touch that as well. And just hold this until I know that that solder has fully cured. Lead that's sitting up through here and just cut it off short. And that's done, that's good to go. No problems. See how much of that comes off there. Thing to note when putting this particular cover back on 
is that there is a relief here for that screw. So be sure that when you put this cover back on, you're minding that. Another thing to be cautious of is you can see this old foam that's in here has gotten hard and dense over the years. And one thing you want to do is try to keep these caps from mo physically moving around too much, especially these big ones over here. You can see I can just touch it and it vibrates. Well, when this head is sitting on a cabinet and you're rocking away, man, that uh, vibration is transferred through the head, through the chassis, to these caps. And over time, that little bit of movement at, at low or high frequencies can end up breaking the solder joint. If you think about it, if I just keep doing this for how long, at some point something's going to give, right? So you want to keep these absolutely still. So one thing that you can do is you can run and you can take this piece out. You can run another piece of foam over this. And how you can develop what you need to do is, of course, take a measurement here from the chassis to the top on, on the inside and then do your deductions and put a piece of foam or something else uh you know that is is going to work to keep these still you could theoretically put silicone in these don't prefer to do that uh especially on turret board style if this were pc board that might be a different story especially since these are axial lead and sitting sideways not going to do a lot of good you're not you're not going to get a, a, a caulk to sit to this and if you are it's going to be a, a big mess so going back with a compression back to the board just like fender designed is probably your best bet or another answer is you just keep this original foam inside if it's in good shape and not crumbling and falling apart and then you build it up with a non um adhering style epoxy so i say epoxy because this is a two-part substance but it's not really a epoxy because when it dries it doesn't have a very sticky nature to it so it won't actually fully adhere it'll kind of grab these capacitors but you can break the seal when you're done and same thing here um on this inside of this foam it'll grab that but it, but it will be a removable layer between the two. So what I'll do is I'll mix them together and then I lay it across the capacitors and try to do a little bit better job than what the factory did here. If, if you see, there's no fill on this side, no fill on this side. So really, this cap will have a little bit of down pressure, but it can still have pressure going that way. So I want even pressure down on, every, on each cap here. So once I get these two screws back in, I'll do that and uh, I'll, let, I'll let you watch what how that works. What I'm gonna do is as we look at this, we can see that these caps won't need as much as these ones because of the overall diameter. This is the original diameter, very similar to the new replacement caps, just slightly smaller. However, the other caps, quite a bit of difference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to overlay this part here a whole lot thicker than I am the end. So you see what's happening. So I still want to get some here, but I really want to get these two ends more importantly. I'm going to build this up so it creates its own like that and then when you, when this goes back on you can see the line there if i'm accurate actually i'm going to slide that down a little bit more there we go if i'm generically accurate that should have a better hold now once we get some compression going down so I'll just be very accurate. Aaron, you can see it's, it's sitting on top, right? So now you can see all the push that I'm having to, to put that on there. And then I won't push it all the way down. I'll let the screws themselves dictate the pressure. All 
Well, I thought I'd show. Let's look under the doghouse anyway, just to see how my uh, putty worked in this instance. See how easily that broke? Now that's putty right on top of the other one. And it's adhered and it is strong and it didn't disturb. I'll show you the electrolytics. It did not disturb any of the labeling on the capacitors. So something else that I like to do uh, for lots of these older screws is yeah it's easy to just kind of get a feel for where the screw should be but if you want to take yourself out of the equation which is advisable in most things so this is a little five pound up to ten pound uh little mini torque wrench and you just go like that tap it tap it so five to six psi on these are plenty you know you could get up to eight or nine but this way you're just guaranteeing that you're not going to strip the screw and you're still going to have enough compression so this particular tool here i can change there's a tool to change the psi so for instance here i like to put these particular ones at seven so i'll find seven there i don't know if you can see that at any rate there's a little tiny seven there Let's see if you can see that little tiny seven seven pounds and i think that's more than plenty and then this goes down inside and then you just take a standard whatever your bit's going to be and put it in there so then you put it in the slot twist it until it pops and then you know you're at seven when you're not stripping the screw out you know they have even pressure and uh, you're helping to preserve the some of this older stuff, the giving it the best shot. So something I thought that I would do is show you guys at least how I clean tube sockets might be different than what you do. But what I do is I take a small mixture of denatured alcohol and contact cleaner, and then I dip the tube about three quarters of the way up the pin into the mixture, give her a little shake, and that gets the liquid 360 degrees around the pin, and then when I put it into the tube socket, I can feel where it needs to seat and then roll it and pick it out. And then I'll just wipe off those pins. And I'll do that two or three times. Put it in the mixture, roll it in, roll it out. And that's second time. And then third time, put it in the mixture. Don't get the pins too deep. Put it in the mixture, roll it in roll it out all right so that's good for that one there now how do you clean the larger pin larger tube sockets so what i do is i clean the individual pins themselves that same mixture if i'm in process with a q-tip getting 360 degrees all the way around the pins and that may seem like overkill, but everybody's got their own way of doing things. So this is just my way. I'll also clean the center pin a little bit and try not to get any fluid down in the tube itself if there's pins missing, like in this particular case. And just general generic clean. And got a little bit of stuff off there, as you can see. So additionally, what I'll do is in order to clean the individual sockets, I'll take a pipe cleaner like this and you can buy them in different uh, you know different setups and so forth like this one is just cloth but this one has some plastic ties in the middle of it and it make, gives it a more coarse so if you've got a really bad tube socket that is you know they're rather um, corroded hopefully not but if you do 
maybe this one would be good um again you can't see it but i can feel it there is a plastic like plastic spikes coming out of the sides there and then this one is just tight woven material and so just dip that in there and then i'll just go into the individual pin and move it around clean 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 move it go on to the next one go on to the next one and you can start to see that i'm getting a little bit of stuff out of there and if you're really looking for compression you can bend the pipe cleaner in half and really press it in there but you have to be careful of how you manipulate that just going through and then for the center socket i will also take a q-tip just a little bit clean out that it, it center portion pin guide here and be sure that i'm fully clean so then that's good enough i don't need to do the same thing here drop that in drop that out so i'll find the center detent and then small circles finished so i'll go through and do the rest of these and that's how i clean tube sockets all right as you can see i haven't cleaned any of this up yet but we'll get around to it um look at that that's that needs definitely needs some tender loving care I'll glue these back down as well, uh, just to be, you know, sure that I've done the best job that I can. Uh, <clears throat> my little setup here, it, you know, a lot of guys, they'll, they're real fancy, and I think that that's wonderful. They will have little fancy stands to hold the head and whatnot, because they don't want the tubes and the transformers sitting down and, and not having, um, you know, any stability with the project in which they're working on. And, uh, well, you know, all the years I've been on the road, if you need to uh, work on a head, typically you just use the chassis itself uh, onto the case of the head. So you can see the orientation here. There's the face, right? So I'm just going to turn it over like this. And then, yeah, is there a concern that it could topple this way? Absolutely. So then you just take something that you got it lying around and then you got a little more stability. You know, so that's just something that's the same height as that, and that works just fine. So then, rather than let's take the head and then just carefully place it inside here, and voila, my own chassis stand. I don't need to go out and buy something fancy or have something made for me, um, you know, or make something myself. So now here we are. So we're on to the next phase of cleaning the pots now. So I'm just going to spray the back open side and then there's a little indent. You don't need a lot, but you need to get enough in there so it makes the carbon track uh, get a little bit wet anyway. And, um, you know, make sure that you keep them all the way down. So two, squir two squirts is usually enough for a, if the pot seems to be in good, good condition. And then making sure you turn it to the maximum back and forth, of course. But these pots seem to be in good shape. Like I say, this amp is untouched by anyone. I'm the first guy to put my hands inside of it. And since it was built, probably. And uh, that's exciting to me. It's sat in an attic is the story with this amp. So those pots are generically cleaned. Since I was showing how to clean the pots just real easy, uh, this is the, what I like to use. It's got silicon on the inside. Got to put something in those potentiometers that has lubricant when you're cleaning them. So one thing that you can do for the jack, since we already cleaned the pots, again, preliminarily, is I just use a jack burnisher. Of course, every time you put a jack in and pull it out, it does have a cleaning element to it because you're physically rubbing wire against wire, wire or uh, sorry, metal against metal. But... Um, in this case, you're able to turn the uh, metal in the in a, in opposing fashion that it wouldn't normally receive. So you can either take your solution. What I do is just take the solution and uh, put it everywhere on there, and then spin it around like this a few times, and that's cleaning it in a way that it wouldn't normally get. 
and that's burnished for the moment. So I'm just rolling this around in that solution off to the side, cleaning the handle, and then getting this guy here. And that is just gonna give me a generic clean, a little bit better than just using the jack with the contact cleaner. And again, for preliminary usage. Now, something that you can do also is you can clean the inside here. Let me zoom in a little bit. You can, if you believe that you have not good contact being made here, you can clean the inside of that fine emery cloth, right? So what I'll do is just pull that back a little bit, stick that inside pull that lightly and you can probably can't tell but there's a little line on there right and then just turn that around and then pull that lightly there you go now you can see that a little bit right and that is just getting off the sitting corrosion since it's been a few years right and i'll just go down and do the rest of that for the other few jacks so you might be asking yourself, well, if you're using the cabinet to hold the chassis, how can you have access to the tubes? Just, just another thing that I do and have done. Just being on the road, I don't carry some you know, big piece of fancy wood to uh, hold the chassis. So I just tilt it inside and uh, just add a piece of you know, E-tape in between the potentiometers and then that keeps the, the pots you know, um, free. I can manipulate them if I need to. And then the amp sits on this transformer, the chassis itself, and I have access to the tubes if I need to, to have access both to the top of the chassis as well as the tubes. Again, just another uh, road thing to share. This particular amplifier is a different beast than what I was talking about with the um with mike pascal vintage fender amplifier repair.com and he sent back an ab165 layout because the chassis on this amp says one ab165 and as we come to find out if we look at this that is ma the majority of that is an ab165 but it's actually not an ab165 even though the uh sticker on the cabinet says so so what is it it's actually an ac568 how do i know all right so if we look at the difference here between the ab165 and the ac568 there's a few changes uh, between these circuits so if we look at the cathode we see that the cathode is tied directly to ground here on through pin eight. If we look here, we will see that there is a 150 ohm, seven watt resistor on both pin eight on of the 6L6GC. And we can see that here, pretty, pretty obvious, right? Additionally, there is a small cap here and that cap is a 2200 pico farad cap. You can see both of them here on the AC568. On the 165, the AB165, that also does not exist. Additionally, another thing that I noticed is the there is a 100 picofarad cap across this 47K resistor in the feedback circuit. And here, uh, there's a little bit of difference. You can see on the 165, that cap is non-existent. So small changes like that. Additionally, so because ultimately I am after making this an AA-864, I am going to have to strip out that uh, 100 picofarad cap right there. I'm not sure if I'll put an 820 in there or not. Uh, we'll see what Mike Pascal has in his directions. But I will also, as you can see in the bias uh, pot here, just uh, there is that there's not the voltage divider of the two 10Ks here on either side down to this 100K right here. So you can see 
this all has to go. You know, um, all those resistors. Additionally, what other work we have ahead of us, and we'll talk about the preamp section in, in a little bit, but of course, these two electrolytics have to go. The bias cap has to go and get replaced. So, and don't put any grooves in that plastic. And there we go, that easy. Didn't damage the plastic. So that is reusable. So we just pull that out. And then when we put the new cord in, all right, so for the area, without having to touch that outside, use the skinnier tool to get it started and at least get those small prongs started in there. And once I do, then I can use the cloth again, use my channel locks, use that angle there see that so i can use that angle push that front side in get it started get it seated there it is so now that's not coming out of there no matter what so there is a standoff and that standoff wire is touching directly to that screw there for the transformer can you see that total connection can push it on a little bit further but uh, they're touching and uh, that's not you know that's probably been an issue for some time so uh, we'll have to make an improvement there All right, that part is done. I just got, I have my main power going to the switch and then from the switch back to the fuse and one side of the uh, primary of the transformer going to the fuse, the other side going to the neutral lead and then the ground going back down here to chassis. Mm -hmm. 